Do you recall a time where people would moan that the AMG V8 had too many cylinders and we'd be better off with only half? Or that AMGs were too loud and they needed to be silenced? Or when people complained that the AMG lacked power? No? Me neither. So what on earth have Mercedes AMG done? Halved the cylinders, turned the music all the way down and added a bushel of power to their apple basket. The elephant in the room, the GLC 63S and the C63S now have a four-cylinder, two-litre turbocharged engine mated to some trick hybrid tech, thus alienating the V8 massive and left many of us scratching our heads. Have AMG gone mad or do we place the blame on the EU emission extremists for clipping the wings of an industry giant? I'd like to run an experiment, an experiment in which we forget that a previous V8 powered GLC 63S ever existed, just for the next 10, 12 minutes. And instead, Mercedes and AMG decided to launch this mid-size SUV with four wheel drive, Formula One tech, producing 680 brake horsepower, capable of the zero to 62 mile an hour sprint in just three and a half seconds. Oh, and by the way, all that is available from a two liter four cylinder engine. Impressive right so well why don't we take a look at the all new glc 63s e performance did i mention it was a plug-in hybrid as well it's a plug-in hybrid as well special thanks to mercedes-benz hertfordshire for lending me their mercedes amg glc 63s e performance premium formatic plus plug-in hybrid night edition suv for anything related to buying a new or a used Mercedes-Benz or servicing and parts, head on over to LNL Automotive. All the links are in the description below. I featured the 300D on the channel a number of months ago and my verdict was and still is that it's a near enough perfect family mid-size SUV. When you take into consideration the practicality, the refinement, the level of equipment and just day-to-day -day usability, it's very difficult to fault. In fact, the only thing I felt let it down was the price. The AMG version, therefore, isn't an altogether different prospect, not at least on paper anyway. All iterations of the GLC are available as a petrol, diesel, as well as a plug-in hybrid. All have formatic as standard and come with a whole array of standard equipment, including LED headlights, parking sensors, reversing camera, climate control, folding mirrors, heated seats, cruise control, powered tailgate, to name a few. There's a tiny difference in length. This is about two centimeters longer than the standard variants. And because of the battery in the boot, we lose 150 liters of boot capacity. There is one metric, one area, that is so far off what a family size SUV entails. Und das ist Macht. Das ist Madness. <lacht> wow. I have missed AMGs. I mean, what? that is just absolute bonkers. Yeah, GLC 63S, 680 brake horsepower, we'll just sign that off. How did that conversation even go? I mean, we're talking supercar power. It can produce over a thousand newton meters of torque. A thousand anything, especially in a family SUV, is just that's crazy. Of which we are currently using none. Now it's all well and good talking about how much power a car possesses or how quickly it can do the zero to 62 mile an hour sprint. However, I think it's important to try and put things into context. To help me, I've spent some money and bought this. For those of you born pre 2000, should know what it is, but for those who don't, it's a classic card game where you can learn facts about Aston Martins, McLarens, Lamborghinis, Ferraris. And I'm gonna put the GLC 63S up against some of the cars featured in this deck of cards. Now, I'm so confident that the GLC will trump that I've not even opened the pack. See, it's still, it's still sealed. So we're gonna do it together. All right, ready? So let's just pick a card. 2017 Ford GT. And see that? Total power, 647. 2019 BMW M8 Competition Grand Coupe, 625 brake. 2018 Mercedes AMG GT four-door coupe, 639 brake. 
Now, I know what you're thinking. I probably got lucky, right? Because there's Bugattis in here, there's Rimax, there's 918 Spider, which obviously have like 800, 750, 840 brake horsepower. However, let's look at some zero to 62 mile an hour times. The 2018 Ferrari 488 Pista Spider, 2.85 seconds. That's 0.65 seconds faster than this GLC 63. A little over half a second. McLaren Speedtail, three seconds. Half a second slower than a McLaren Speedtail. Look at this, Aston Martin Vulcan, three seconds, half a second. There's half a second between these two cars. Now, of course, in equal measure, there are just as many cars that absolutely blow the GLC 63S out of the water. But that exercise was just to show you that it can really hold its own against some very exotic competition. AMG claimed that the GLC 63S is a technical masterpiece. And in many ways, it is. The rapid power delivery. The immediate response the fast torque buildup. I'll go more into the driving dynamics a little bit later on, but it does have an Achilles heel. So depending on what driving program you're in and the conditions, so the condition of the battery, for example, will dictate how much of that torque, how much of that power, how much of that performance you can tap into. Although the electrical assistance is always available, the motor contributes up to 204 brake horsepower for a limited time. So your continuous power is a little over 100 bhp. However, it's not something you're likely to notice on a day-to-day -day basis. Because you have electric motors that power up the turb, spool the turbo so there's no lag, two gears and so if you, on full power, if everything's all right, before I get a nosebleed, I'm gonna pass you on to someone who can probably explain it a lot better than I can. Hello, my name is Ken and I'm wearing a hat because I need to, but you can't tell where my skin stops and the hat starts. What we've got in terms of the powertrain, it is mind boggling. So we have an engine called M139. Those of you that know your A45s will know it already. But here it has an L on the end because it's mounted longitudinally for a rear wheel drive based chassis that the car sits in. On its own, the engine makes 476 horsepower, exactly the same as the new SL55 that has a V8. But here, it has quite a lot of hybrid assistance. So it has an integrated starter generator, it's beltless at the front, and the turbocharger itself borrows a bit of tech from F1 by having a electric motor mounted on the shaft that sits between the two turbines. That can spin it up to maximum RPM like that, so there is no turbo lag whatsoever. At the back is the second part of the powertrain, which involves a two-speed electric motor. That means that it can give the car electrical assistance from zero miles per hour all the way up to its top speed. And it's mounted at the back so that there's less transmission losses when the electricity goes from the battery, which is kept at 45 degrees Celsius at all times, the battery's optimum operating temperature directly to the rear wheels. And through some sort of transmission witchcraft, it can send it to the front as well. The result is a car that has two powertrains. It has multiple cooling circuits, one for the engine, one for the motor, one for the batteries as well. And this compact-ish, medium-sized SUV, let's call it, has more output in both horsepower and torque than a Mercedes-AMG S65. Back to you, Gok. Still with me? Now imagine trying to explain that to your mates when they ask you what this is. Now at this point, I'd like to reintroduce the old GLC 63S back into the conversation. It was a very popular car. It had a very explosive V8 and a hair raising soundtrack. The most important two ingredients to make the GLC AMG a fan favorite. So why the wholesale changes? Take the AMG Project One for instance, first announced in 2017 and took all of about five years before we saw the production of one. It has a 1.6 litre petrol engine and very heavy hybrid influence. The Project One is one of the most exclusive AMGs, if not cars in the world, sold for over two million pound a pop. And the technical difficulties and the teething issues aside, I don't, I don't remember many people complaining that it didn't have a V8. AMG being AMG, it was all about the pioneering of such uncharted grounds when it came to developing such engine technology. 
it's true. AMG done away with a lot of the things that we love, but they've showed us not only have they got a sense of humor, but a thirst for innovation and forward thinking. I'll explain why, but I personally don't mind that the GLC variant doesn't have a V8 because the performance, the depth of ability that this thing possesses is biblical. The reason I say that is because I believe V8s are better suited for coupes, sports cars. I would have loved if they kept the V8 in the C63S for example, but I can live without it in this caliber of car. It'll be interesting to see what they do with the CLE. Time will tell. I think a car like this is gonna appeal more to families that have an itch for an AMG as opposed to like a purist or someone who's gonna maybe track the car. As long as the performance is there, maybe the V8 doesn't have to be. So let's talk about the driving dynamics. Is it all marketing jargon or is it as good as the brochure says? So what we could do is put it into Sports Plus or Race. Let's put it into Race and do a I'm late to drop the kids off to school run. Wow. It feels unbelievably sure footed. There is absolutely no drama taking it around the bends whatsoever. Oh my god, it feels so pokey, it feels so potent. <laughs> I don't know what's real and what's not, but I am getting a few pops and bangs from the exhaust. It just feels so light and nimble, it feels like a proper sports car that you can throw around. One of the first things that you notice is when you're driving a V8, a naturally aspirated V8 or something with good turbos, is that you put your foot down and the response is almost instantaneous and you get this V8 burble and that's it, you're propelled down the road. In this, it's much the same, if not a bit more responsive, but it's the electrical power that gives you that 30 yard instant gain. And then that's it, everything is just blurred. You, you're well up to speeds that perhaps you shouldn't be. I've often thought that a sports car should be a sports car and an SUV should be an SUV. And rarely should they come together because it always felt like a compromise of the two. I was wrong. Clearly, I know nothing. Because the way this thing accelerates, the way it gathers speed, the way it corners and how flat it stays, considering a 2.3 ton weight is nothing short of a remarkable feat of engineering. Now one thing I haven't spoken about is the lack of the V8 soundtrack because well, there isn't a V8 in here but two things. Firstly the sensory overload that you get from being propelled to 60 mile an hour in just three and a half seconds coupled with the engine sound the turbo spooling up and the whining sounds that you get from the battery and the electric motors still contribute to a very enjoyable driving experience. Failing that, you have the Burmester surround sound system, which is, in my opinion, the best sound system that I've ever heard in any car. G-Wagons, Maybachs and top of the range Porsches all use Burmester. And I suspect, all for good reason. Ready, one, two, three, foot down. It's the agility that I'm most impressed with. The response from the steering wheel. This one, of course, does have rear axle steering, so that helps really reduce the car's footprint on the road. I highly doubt that I'm using anywhere near the 680 brake horsepower that this thing can produce. And for the first time on this channel, I'm inclined to say, it does not need all that power. With each passing second, it just wants to go even quicker. The roads that I'm driving on, there is really no other word for it. They're terrible. But even still, the ride is very, very fair. Firm, but fair. The brakes, 
when I've been driving it in comfort mode, and it's something that I wasn't anticipating, but then when you think about it, it's a hybrid, is you have that hybrid braking feel. If you're not familiar with that is, divide the braking process into two. So the first half, it feels very spongy, and the reason for that is that the brake pads don't actually make contact with the disc. Instead, your momentum is recuperated into energy to put power back into the battery. And then, as you work your way through the travel of the brake pedal, then the pads eventually make contact with the disc, and that's when the brakes start feeling a little bit more traditional, a bit more what we're used to. While we're on the subject of driving, let me talk to you a little bit about the different driving modes that you have available. So we have our default program, which is comfort. And then when you flick the dial on the right-hand side of the steering wheel, you go into sports, you have sports plus, and then you have race. In each of these modes, you can also set your own parameters. So if you want to adjust the suspension, the gearbox, the artificial sounds that come through the speakers, you can adjust all of those. When you go the other way, you have electric drive. So if you want to only use the electric motors to drive, you can do that. You have B mode, which is battery hold. So if you know you're driving into a city center, for example, and you want to save what charge you have in the battery to do the city driving, you can also do that. You have individual, which lets you set your own parameters in every aspect. And then you have slippery for snowy, icy conditions. Interestingly, something that you usually only find in electric vehicles is the different recuperation levels. So when you press the button that you use to adjust your different driving modes, you're met with a little infographic of a battery and here you can set the different level of recuperation. So you've got low, medium, high for example. And when you set it to high, essentially it adopts a single pedal driving mode. So when you lift your foot off the accelerator, you almost start to feel the car braking. And what you're doing there is putting power back into the battery. I have to come clean about something. I judged that this car long before I even stepped foot into one. Hence the apology in the title of this video. What on earth are AMG playing at? How can you put all that power, all that heritage, all that emotion, all that drama, all that experience into a two litre four cylinder electrified engine? How is that remotely close to anything that any of us ever wanted? Maybe it's AMG flexing its muscle, showing us what they're capable of from a technical engineering point of view. Maybe it's the pressures of EU regulators. Chances are, it's a bit of both. If it wasn't for the previous generation GLC 63S, I feel like this would be held as one of the most powerful, dynamic, capable, and just all round well put together super sport SUVs currently on the market. Whether it can ever shake off its reputation as once having a glorious V8, I guess it's down to the court of public opinion. And because of that, I don't think it's ever going to fully get the flowers that it deserves. Let me tell you a little bit about the things that I like and things that I don't. Firstly, I love the performance. It is absolutely monumental. Secondly, the kit, the equipment. It is an absolute space station in here. And thirdly, I love the way this thing looks. It looks aggressive, it looks powerful, and I think just the proportions, the design, the wheels, everything is mwah, chef's kiss. The design language continues into the cabin. The carbon fiber look on the dash fits well, and although there is a lot of screen, the same could be said for 90% of cars on the market. I like the ergonomics of the steering wheel, made up of premium materials with a nice feel. The amount of information that you have access to will either excite or overwhelm you, depending on your preference. For me, once I customized everything just how I liked, I didn't feel the need to keep changing. The stopwatch is a render of an IWC watch, which is a nice touch, but a physical clock face would have been better in a car in this segment. There are also racetracks that you can register your lap times should you decide to leave the family at home and track the GLC. In terms of dislikes, this piano black interior, it, this trend just needs to die. And I'm talking to all manufacturers that put this glossy piano black stuff in their interiors. The ridges in my fingerprint is enough to mark it. Just get rid, bin it, use this stuff, use the carbon fiber stuff that's all around here, much nicer. The other thing is frugality. Now, granted, I've not been driving with much battery power, much EV, 
So it's been maybe like 90%, 85%, 90% on the combustion engine alone. And at the moment, I've done 86 miles today, average 22 mile an hour over four hours. I'm getting 23.4 miles to the gallon. Now you've half the capacity of the engine, you've half the amount of cylinders, and it feels that I'm no better when it comes to polluting the earth. Hmm, it's just something to think about. Prices for the 63S Premium Plus is an eyebrow raising £121,530. There's actually nothing here. They don't print brochures anymore, so. That represents a 30 something thousand pound uplift from the last generation 63S. Now I will concede the fact that a lot of what I mentioned is first world problems and really not that big a deal. For me, the biggest sticking point is the price of the car. 120 something thousand pounds is a lot of money. Granted, it is a lot of car, but for that money you could buy the last gen GLC 63S and the C63S Coupe and still have 30, 40,000 pounds left to spare. You'd have eight liters worth of engines and 16 cylinders. So how do you justify it? I guess one way to look at it is that your car and Lewis Hamilton's company car would have a lot in common, F1 tech. I hope you enjoyed this video, found it informative, useful, or at least entertaining. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and leave a comment down below letting me know whether you think Mercedes AMG have done the right thing by taking the V8 out or they've completely gone mad and they should have stuck with the V8. Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.